Hey, I'm Michael. This is Michael Games, and welcome to the Metroidvania Forge, where we're going to build an epic Metroidvania-style game in Godot 4 from scratch using GDScript. Now, I want to kind of give a brief recap. Many of you know me from the action RPG series that I've been producing over the last year and a half, two years, and that series has covered a lot of material. And, you know, I, I remember midway through that project stopping and reflecting on where I've been, and I even shared some thoughts with you of, of lessons I'd learned, things that I wanted to improve, and ways that I felt like we could make the series better. And so I worked on implementing those and, and continued forward. And now as I start on this new series, I hope to take another step forward in a few areas and really make this a project that you guys can be proud of and that I'm gonna love as well. Uh, just like we did in the Action RPG series where we built most of what you need to create a small game, everything from player to enemies, UI elements, and even a quest system and you know some great features there. We're gonna do a similar thing with this Metroidvania Forge series. You know, the path was a little windy at times with the Action RPG series. I, it wasn't always clear to maybe the viewer or even to myself what would come next. And I kind of relied a lot on feedback from the community to decide which features to implement. And while that was great and we were able to add some cool features that I didn't intend on, the result was a little bit of a meander through. And so as I look at this next series, I'm going to be focusing down just a little bit more. I'm gonna be a lot more transparent about my decision-making, the planning, and the process of how I go about working on a complex project like this. So by the end of the Metroidvania Forge series here, we're gonna build a playable Metroidvania, and it's gonna be complete with exploration elements, it's gonna have all the player abilities that you would need for a base Metroidvania, it's gonna have all the critical game systems that you need, as well as polish and game juice to make sure that the game feels and plays great. This means that I'm gonna bring the same in-depth approach to my videos. I'm still gonna be talking, going through all the details and giving explanations of why I'm making the de decisions I'm making, but I'm also gonna be more transparent about some of the work that I do before I hit record. This initial video right now is gonna be the first example of that. We're gonna define the project scope of the Metroidvania and we're also gonna have a broad overview of the whole series. So you're gonna see kind of where I plan to go from now. As we approach each chapter in this series, we'll dig deeper into the specific plans and goals and processes that I go through as I develop those features. So whether it be the player or the game level system, level design, even some audio and visual, as I've kind of teased in my trailer, I'm gonna go through how I'm kind of planning and prepping and carrying through with those parts of the project. So let's get started by defining what this Metroidvania project is. Okay, I think a really important aspect of choosing this project is kind of the why and what is the game, right? I mean, what is a Metroidvania? And why is it so important that we define these things? Now, some people would probably argue that you could just start developing fun stuff and have a sandbox, you know? And I think that's pretty valid. And if that's what you want to do, that's fine. But I do think that regardless, it's important that you have some goal or something that you're trying to explore, whether that's a specific feature or game mechanic or style, right? You need to have something. And so that what we're doing by defining this as a Metroidvania is we're giving ourselves a box, a sandbox that we can play within, and it's going to help us be able to make decisions, right? As to why Metroidvania, you know, I have a pretty big history with Metroidvanias and it's one of my favorite genres. And in fact, when I really got into game development and I originally was working in Unity, I had built this game Tundra for the Metroidvania Month Jam. I can't remember which iteration it was. It was pretty early on. And the game did pretty well, but, you know, really looking back at it, the game wasn't that great. It did well because of the, the visual aspect of, of the project compared to the other ones that were entered at that time. Um, but that was my first entry, and I realized I had a lot to learn. In subsequent years, I did a couple more, you know, in that same jam, I did um, a little bit of help on one called Rest Stop 23 with uh, my brother-in-law and one of his friends. And we later went on to enter another, probably the subsequent Metroidvania jam, where we created a game called One Hero's Trash, and this was entered and, and did quite well. And then I did one more before I kind of put the Metroidvania behind me for a bit, and that one was called Millennial Warrior and also did pretty good considering I did it as a solo project. And in fact, I'm gonna be referencing the Millennial Warrior project quite a bit because it's one that I made and so I can kind of, I already have a good example of how to build some of the features and maybe we'll even improve upon how I did it in the past. But that being said, I love Metroidvanias and this is the box that we're working within. But as we look at the goals and the features required to make a Metroidvania game, you know, we have to consider that this is most likely a 2D action platformer. It doesn't have to be, right? But that's where I'm gonna go with this. It's going to feature non-linear exploration, 
which is a little bit easier to tackle from a 2D perspective as well. We need progression and discovery, and these items both need to be unlocked by the player abilities, right? That's, that's pretty integral to the Metroidvania. So the goals and features that I think are needed for a Metroidvania, I'm gonna outline here. Now this is an exercise that you should do on your own, and you can copy mine for this if you want, but uh, you're gonna have your own ideas that you're gonna maybe add to this list and you might wanna remove some. Now, some of the things on my list are gonna be required for just about any game, right? Um, and then others, again, are gonna be kind of depending on what you wanna do. So first, when we look at the player and the abilities in a Metroidvania, now we, we need basic abilities like running, jumping, crouching, maybe crouching is optional, I don't know. Um, we're gonna have the ability to attack and I'm thinking multiple attacks. We're gonna build probably a basic combo, maybe nothing too complex, but something to get you started. When it comes to jumping, there's usually a double jump in a Metroidvania so that you can have some way to get up to higher, you know, higher places that you couldn't reach until you get the ability. And a dash ability is a good one. I like the Metroidvania morph roll, or the, I should say the Metroid morph roll ability. And so even though that doesn't fit with kind of the general theme of where I'm going with a more of a Castlevania slant on what we're gonna be building, I do want to build that morph roll, I think, because I think that's a fun ability to explore. Then there could be other abilities like a ground slam or maybe a pogoing off enemies when you're attacking and jumping, uh, as well as things like wall stick or jumping off walls. Now for this series, we're not going to necessarily do all of those, but that's kind of the basic list I came up with when I was starting. So we'll probably eliminate two of them off that list is my thought. Next, we've got enemies. We're gonna have to build at least a few basic types of enemies, right? We'll have some of those basic walking enemies like zombies or skeletons. We'll probably have some stationary ones that throw or shoot projectiles at the player. We're gonna want some special flying abilities, maybe Medusa heads, something in the, in, along those lines, and some basic AI-driven en enemies. And so maybe they're basically, you're like your basic walking enemies, except they're a little bit smarter. They don't just walk in a straight line. Maybe they chase the player a little bit, things like that. We're starting to get more features, right? This list is gonna get bigger. Boss battles, we're gonna need boss battles. I think there's two general types for a Metroidvania. There's the large kind of level set piece kind of bosses, you know, where basically the boss is part of the whole level and they're giant usually. And you know, you're kind of dodging timed attacks and maybe they telegraph their attack a little bit so you kind of know what you gotta dodge. But then we've also got small player-like bosses that are gonna be more kind of like you're fighting another, you know, human player almost like you got a guy that he can jump and attack and do a dash just like you can okay so those are the two general types of bosses that we might look at for a game like this when it comes to levels and exploration there's a lot we could look at some of the things i'm thinking of that we might need for our game are well obvious one is ability gating right we've already talked about that secrets and hidden areas those are kind of a must for this kind of game at least if you want it to be exciting and rewarding to the player Safe areas where you can save your game and maybe get your health back. Unlockable passages, maybe that fits with secrets. Treasure chests, moving platforms, one-way platforms, environmental hazards. And that's a pretty basic list. You may have other ideas that you want to add. Game systems. Now these are less gameplay features, although some of these you will see do tie in, but we need to be able to support like our player health. And maybe if you could expand that to have other player stats. Saving and loading player ability acquisition, health upgrades, some form of persistence for your game, you know, beyond just the save game, like, okay, if you unlock a door, when you come back, it stays unlocked, things like that. Uh, when you defeat a boss, he's no longer there. Enemy spawning systems, and potentially even dialogue and cutscene systems. Now, you know, I'm just coming off of, I'm in fact, I'm still in the middle of making the cutscene system for the action RPG series. Okay, so you could probably just take that and put it in here. I don't know if I'll be doing a specific cutscene system for this game or not yet. Interfaces and UI. You're gonna have player HUD. You're gonna have UI for the menus. You're gonna have a map system. You, you need a map system with a Metroidvania. So that's definitely a must for this game. A title screen, game over screen, things like that. And then one last category I'm gonna put in here for now is just the, the polish of the game. So that, that comes, you know, with things like visual effects and particle effects, adding audio, um, refining the audio, music to the game, and just honing in on and polishing that game feel and adding game juice, making sure the game feels tactile and fun and rewarding to play. So that's kind of my list. This is the list that I came up with. And again, this list isn't fully comprehensive. And I don't want you guys to think of, a, of documentation like this as a set in stone, you have to do this to make your project. 
Rather, this should be kind of a guideline. And in fact, as I mentioned, I'm going to narrow a couple things out of this because some of you are probably looking at this list and thinking that looks kind of daunting. And I promise you that within each of these items, or at least a lot of them, there's even more that we need to consider as we're making the game. So it can become overwhelming really quick. Okay, and so the benefit of this list, it will allow us to kind of triage our project. If we start working on something and we're not sure if it fits, we can come back to this list. Hey, is this like something I actually want in my project? Is it critical? And the answer may be yes, but maybe it's no. Or maybe it's yes, but you decide, okay, this is more important than this other feature. Let me swap it out for priority, okay? This is going to help you make decisions, have priorities, and be able to think critically about a project that just, quite frankly, is really complicated and complex to build. In addition to our list of features and all of that, there are some other requirements and or constraints that we need to put on our project. And these requirements here are kind of obvious, maybe, but we're building our game in Godot 4. Okay, so that's going to be one. Uh, we're going to be using GD Script. I'm going to be making a 2D game and specifically pixel art, although it's not going to be required to be pixel art. You can do higher resolution art and you should be able to follow along with this tutorial if you want to. Of course, I will provide some basic versions of a lot of the art that I use. So, you know, if you are not skilled at art, don't want to take the time to do that right now and just want to get started, you can always use some of my assets. Um, we're going to be using a sprite for pixel art. You don't have to have a sprite. And again, you don't have to do pixel art. But if you have a sprite or a similar software that you can use to create your, your pixel art, that's going to help a lot. We will be making a small original soundtrack, and I'm not going to make a lot of videos about making music because I'm not a music expert, but I am a creative and I love to dabble and I've learned some things that I want to share with you and show you some cool tools. Okay, so we'll make a, a small original soundtrack for the game, maybe three or four tracks, and it's going to be a smaller scope game. I think that's important to define to say, okay, look, I'm not making a full Metroidvania with, you know, 150 rooms and 18 bosses or something like that. No, it's going to be small. We're going to have maybe two boss fights. We're going to have just a series of rooms. I don't know how many it's going to take to make it explore the feature set, but maybe 10 to 15 rooms, something like that, and some basic enemy sets. All right. So these are good and important constraints. These constraints are kind of designed around the fact that I'm making a tutorial series. So for your game, you may want to change them. But if this is your first game, do yourself a favor and stick with this because you're going to build the basics and then you can use that as a base or a platform to build the more advanced game in the future okay you don't have to start with the full game now you can build little pieces and then eventually as you acquire all the skills that you need you'll be able to build a fully featured game and hopefully be able to release it um, and i should put it's not listed here but one of the things that we're going to be doing in this series is i'm going to get a little bit more into the publishing for sure we're going to be talking about how to prepare a game to be published for web builds and building for you know your desktop so pc mac and linux so we'll do a little bit of that as well now the last thing i want to cover with you this is not something that you need to do but because i've kind of put thought into all of this i even have a pretty well defined plan for how i want the series to go it's going to be broken into chapters right now we're in the prologue okay there's only going to be a couple videos here but this prologue is the introduction to the project and setting it up in godot so we're going to cover just a few basic things over the course of, I'm thinking it'll be three videos by the time they're all released, okay? Why I've done this is I really want to, like I mentioned, I really want to kind of hone in on a few things and I want to make this series a little bit more easy to follow, a little bit more cohesive. We're going to try and leave fewer loose ends on features that we build, unless they're just things that are homework for you to go expand on. So that means when we build a player, we're going to build chunks and we're going to make sure that they work quite well before we move on to the next piece. And that is chapter one. It's going to be the core player mechanics. You know, we're going to have a player state machine because you know me, I like to build state machines. This is going to be slightly different, but just a different version of the same kind of state machine that I've built with you in the past, both in the action RPG and in the little mini platformer series. The next section is going to be about world building foundations. We're going to be looking at not just tile maps, but how to set up and design, create those rooms, how to paint the levels, you know, so practical stuff. We're going to be building some basic level systems. So we've got scripts for our levels, transitions to other rooms, and we'll even start looking at how we're going to do some of these ability gatings, you know, so what types of features or structures in our level do we need to support that, as well as some of the basic things like maybe environmental hazards and things like that. All right. 
The third section is going to be our world game systems, save and load systems, making sure we support music playback and so we can play audio tracks, as well as having that pause menu with the world map system because that's going to be a pretty critical feature to making this game work. Next is going to be advanced player mechanics. So at this point, we'll have a world that we can play around in, but we need to be able to implement some of those features like the double jump, the dash, the morph roll, and all of those things, okay? And so we're gonna get back into that player state machine. We're gonna really refine it. He's gonna have all the core abilities or maybe even all the abilities for our game by the time we're done with chapter four. Chapter five is gonna be enemies and AI. And so I think it's pretty straightforward. We're gonna build these. We're gonna build basic enemy types. We're going to build the systems for player and enemy to be able to damage or hurt each other. We're going to have player death scenarios, enemy drops if needed, and the different enemy types as well as some basic uh, AI type enemies. Once we've completed that, we'll be ready to add our first boss fight to the game and maybe even our second. Okay, and that's pretty straightforward. That's just going to be an extension of the enemies. And then by the time we're done with all of that, we'll be able to polish optimize and prepare our game for release. And so those are the chapters that I've got laid out. And I've got a document, you can find the link in the description and you can go and check that out and view a little bit more of a breakdown about what I'm thinking I'm gonna be doing with each of these videos. I will note, this is subject to change because this is a, a living document, right? I don't, I don't do things um, super by the book. I'm just trying to be organized and show you how I can organize those things, but don't feel like it has to be super rigid and try not to hold me to that too, because <laughs> I may have a wild idea that I want to do, or there may be something that comes up in the community that we need to address. And so I'm going to veer off the plan a little bit. So now that I've done this and you're watching this video, if you've made it this far, then I'm assuming that you're interested in going through this journey with me. And so I'm, I'm more than happy to have you come along. So what you should do is subscribe if you haven't so that you can see when the next video comes out. If you'd like, you can join my Discord. There will be a link in the description to that as well. We've got a lot of people in there. You're going to see that it's a pretty awesome and supportive community. So if, if, you're, if you're feeling like you need a group of dev people, you can go in there. Maybe you'll even find a future team. I don't know. But I have homework for you. So what you need to do now is you need to go through this process and you need to make a list. Of what are the goals and features that you want from your Metroidvania? Because as you approach this project, hopefully, even if I don't teach you how to make a feature you want, we'll at least be able to address the fundamental information, knowledge, and skills that you need to be able to implement the feature on your own. And if you're thinking about that now, then you're going to have a head start on anybody who's not thinking about it. So make a document, write it on a, a napkin or some tissue paper or whatever it is you're going to do, but come up with a plan for your game and what do you want your Metroidvania to be. So there we go. That's the Metroidvania Forge. This is our box that we're going to be building within, and it's time for you to kind of take the reins for just a little bit and get working on that. In our next video, we're going to be looking at how to set up our project in Godot. So if you're new to Godot, this is going to be a pretty critical one. We'll get that going. We'll make sure that you feel comfortable, and then we'll be ready to dive into chapter one after that, where we'll start building our player. And as always, we'll see you next time.